Father in heaven, thank you that you are ever so good, you are ever so kind to us, and Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a hammer breaking things in our heart. It's uh, like a fire, and uh, we pray for your spirit to be our leader, to be our teacher this evening. We know that we are with your sheep, we are with your people, and we know that your sheep hear your voice. So we pray for your spirit to use the words spoken tonight, to use the scriptures that we go through this evening to speak incredibly specifically to the things that you have pertinent to each one of us. Your sheep hear your voice, Lord, and so, and in that we trust, and we trust your spirit to do what only you can do. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are in Josiah, we're dealing with Josiah, we're in Second Chronicles chapter 34. I'm going to tuck in pretty quickly here. We have a pretty lengthy text before us this evening, so let's get right to it. Chapter 34, we'll be dealing with verses 1, 2, 3 for the minute, right? It says this, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still a youth, he began to seek the Lord, to seek God the God of his father, David. And in the 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the ashram, the carved images, and the molten images. Those are the first three verses that we have of Josiah. We see that he is eight years old when he becomes king. Incredible, I think. Incredible. Some of you have not had this great pleasure of teaching in our children's ministry. Let me invite you to do that. You will meet many eight-year-olds. And then you will know what it was like, a a small way to see what it must have been like to have Josiah at eight years old, the king. Man, can you imagine? Some of you have kids, grandkids, eight years old. Can you imagine that eight-year-old being the king? Crazy. But we see Josiah, eight years old, king, and we see very quickly that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Yes, he did what was right. Good. We see that he's pictured as a David. Good. David was the ideal king. We see Josiah, the ideal king, an ideal king, a Davidic king. And we see that he doesn't depart. He doesn't go to the left. He doesn't go to the right. He follows and sticks with what the Lord has. There's a passage in Matthew, really in the Sermon on the Mount, um, chapter 7, and it's verse 13 and 14. It says this, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and there are very few who find it. The road is narrow before us. And I think we need to consider for just a second, Josiah followed the narrow road. He followed the narrow path. I think we need to consider for a second if we are following that narrow path. Are we on that narrow path or has something in the course of the day, in the course of our lives, caused us to veer ever so slightly from the narrow path? If we have veered off ever so slightly, let this be our opportunity to stop. And instead of continuing on our path, stop, get back on the road, get on the way that the Lord has for us. We see Josiah walking that narrow path. Are we seeking to enter with that narrow path? Jesus makes it very, very specific. Enter through the narrow gate. And he himself, of course, is that very narrow way. Are we entering through that narrow way? Um, Verse 3. We see that he starts to seek the Lord. Um, as a youth. It says in his eighth year, which means he was eight years old when he became king, we see him at 16. I know the 16-year-olds in the room are like, what? There's a 16-year-old, and he is a youth, and he is seeking the Lord. Yes, he is young, and he is seeking the Lord. And that's because it doesn't matter how old you are, we can all seek the Lord. There is something about us when we are children. There is something about children, young people, that has, we have a tenderness towards the Lord at that young age. There is a tenderness, and we see this in Josiah, that as he was 16, a youth, 
he makes a decision. All of us have to make a decision, brethren. There's two paths before us. There's the path that leads to life. There's the path that leads to death. The choice is before us. I hope we will all choose that narrow path that leads to life. But it does require a decision from us because you remember that there's that song that, that used to play even when I was a kid. It was called The Highway to Hell. I, I think we're all familiar with the song. We're on a highway to hell. Well, guess what? If you do not get off that highway, that's what's going to happen. Yes? That is the default path that we are born in and that we are on. We have to make that decision to get off that path, turn to Jesus who is ever so loving and kind to us, and get on the narrow path, the good path that he has for us. Let's get off that old path. It says, oh, before I go any further, Josiah. I think sometimes we consider the many things that we're not good at, and we go, God, could you use me? Maybe you could, maybe you couldn't. Oh, God, God, you know, I'm not so good at this. You know, Lord, I wish I could do that, but... Uh, th th this is holding me back. You know, I'm not the smartest guy. I'm not the brightest guy. I'm not the best with my hands. Stop. Look at Josiah. Eight years old and 16 years old. He's seeking the Lord. And I think in Josiah we see God doesn't need someone as bright as Solomon. He doesn't need someone as strong as Samson. He doesn't even need someone as beautiful as Esther. He needs a willing person is what he needs. Will we be that willing person? person that the Lord will choose to use. God desires our availability more than our ability. Our availability is more important to the Lord than, of course, our abilities, because God can use anyone. And look at Josiah, used here in, in, in an extraordinary way, really. We will unpack that a little bit more, but used in an extraordinary way. We see that he seeks the Lord, and of course we see here in verse 3 that he starts to purge the nation of uh, Judah and Jerusalem, or the high places, the ashram, the carved images, the molten images, the idols that were in the land. We see in Josiah already taking a stand for the Lord. I want to talk really, really quickly here about this idea of progressive sanctification because we see it in Josiah, right? It's not like Josiah one day wakes up, okay, he's seeking the Lord, and, but we see a develop, uh, development in, a, in him. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still a youth, he began to seek the Lord, uh, uh, the father of his David, and in the twelfth year, he began to purge. Do we see that there's a four-year time span there, right? We see this four years. We see Josiah being developed, if you will. We see de development in his walk with the Lord and his closeness with the Lord. And so I want to bring us here really quickly to this somewhat intimidating word, sanctification, progressive sanctification. It basically, basically, basically means us becoming more and more holy in our lives. Us becoming more and more holy in our lives. Progressive sanctification. Because God is not saying to us, Brethren, you have to be perfect. You have to have all things together. No, no, no. God is saying that there is a process here. It takes a bit of time. We see that in Josiah. Four years, he seeks the Lord, and then there is a result that he starts to purge them. So progressive sanctification. It's a process, and it's not done overnight. Um, there was a book that I could point you to. The title was Disciples Are Made. They're not born. Hendrickson, I believe it was the man who wrote it. But disciples are made, not born. We're not all of a sudden right at the point, you know, of this perfection. No, no, no. We, we grow into that. So progressive sanctification. Um, I'll take a little excerpt here from Oswald Chambers. Oswald Chambers. Some of you are familiar with that name, I'm sure. Some of you maybe not so much. But for those of you who are not, he wrote this incredible, it, it, actually he didn't even write this devotional, it was taken from excerpts of his writings that they managed to put a devotional together called My Utmost for His Highest. My Utmost for His Highest, I know um, it was much more popular in times gone by, but uh, just a quick excerpt from Oswald, because he expresses things so Poignantly, I think is the word to use, poignantly and, and well in a way that I can't. He says this, am I willing 
to reduce myself down to simply me? Am I determined enough to strip myself of all, my, all that my friends think of me and all that I think of myself? Am I willing and determined to hand my, over my simple, naked self to God? Once I am, he will immediately sanctify me completely and my life will be free from being determined and persistent toward anything except God. Sweet little nugget there. You can look it up for your frame of reference, I believe, on the 22nd of July. Perhaps to come at it another way, Philippians 1 verse 6 says this, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. No doubt many of you will have that verse bolded and underlined in your Bibles. But perhaps another one, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 through 24. It says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he will also bring it to pass. Brethren, we're a process. That sanctification where sin has less and less influence on our lives and the Spirit of God increasingly has more influence on our lives is a process. We see it in Josiah here, and we see the results of it here. He starts to purge the nation. He starts to purge Judah. And when that happens in our lives, guess what's going to happen to us? we're also going to start to purge the things, the idols, the sin, the other things in our lives that when we first start seeking after the Lord, guess what? We, our eyes may not even be open to that thing that might be right there, so evident in us. Let's pick up verse 4. It says this. They tore down the altars of the Baals and the presence and the incense altars that were high above them, and he chopped them down. Also the ashram, the carved images, the molten images. He broke in pieces and he ground to powder and he scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed them. We see here, of course, him tearing down and completing and doing more of this. It's really explaining what he did, right? And verse 5, we get this very, very interesting verse. It says this. Then he burned the bones of the priests on their altars and purged Judah and Jerusalem. He burned them. He burned the bones of the priests. Isn't that not a weird image to you? He burned the bones of the priests. Why would he do that? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to answer that for you. And you're going to see something really, really pretty sweet. Because you and I didn't know, perhaps, some of you may well, but 300 years before this, there was a little prophecy talking about a man named Josiah. Some of you know what I'm going with this. Um, it is in 1 Kings chapter 13, and it's in verses 1 through 3. I'll read it for us because I believe it is pertinent for our discussion. Now behold, there came a man of God from Judah to Bethel, by the word of the Lord, while Jeroboam was standing by the altar to burn incense. He cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O oh, altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name. And on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. Then he gave a sign that same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be split apart, and the ashes which are on it shall be poured out. 300 years before this, we see Josiah's name being prophesied. Well, of course, Kings wasn't written 300 years before that, but the event happened 300 years before that. And we see in this, oh my goodness, God's word stands true, even if it's not in our lifetime, <laughs> or our children's children's lifetime, that God's word stands true. What an incredible little prophecy. We'll pick it up in verses 6 through 8. It says this, in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, even as far as Naphtali, in the surrounding ruins, he also tore down the altars, beat the ashram, and carved the images into powder, and he chopped down all the incense altars throughout the land of Israel. And then he turned to, returned to Jerusalem. So, of course, we see him grinding up these, these idols, these things, and he's grinding them to powder. 
I like to think that he, he, may have, he didn't have super glue, right? There was no super glue at that time. But even if the people had super glue at that time, they weren't going to be able to super glue these idols and make them back into what they once were before. He ground them and he did a complete job. He went and he completely, he completely, completely, completely smashed these idols to powder, it tells us. No super glue could save them. And thank God for that. Verse 8 through 13, we're going to tackle pretty quickly here. Um, but let's get into verses 8 through 13. There's some incredible things happening down the text. It says, now, it says this, Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shephan, the son of Azaliah, Messiah, an official of the city, and Joah, the son of Jehoahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. Um, no doubt you guys have heard me go on about the house of the Lord being the representation of the presence of the Lord in, with the people. So that's verse 8. It says this, Then they came, then they came to Hilkiah, Hilkiah, the high priest, and he delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites, the doorkeepers, had collected from Manasseh and Ephraim and from the remnant of Israel and from all Judah and Benjamin and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And then they gave it into the hands of the workmen who had oversight over the house of the Lord. And the workmen who were working in the house of the Lord used it to restore and repair the house. They in turn gave it to the carpenters and to the builders to buy quarried stone and timber for couplings and to make beams for the, housings, for the houses which the kings of Judah had let go. The, king did work faithful, the men did work faithfully with foremen over them to supervise Jahath and Obadiah, the Levites of the sons of Merari, Zechariah, Meshulam of the sons of the Kohathites and the Levites, all who were skillful with musical instruments. They were, over, they were also over the burden bearers and supervised all the workmen from job to job. And some of the Levites were scribes and officials and gatekeepers. So, we see here at, in his 18th, reign, 18th year of power or 18th year of his rule, which means he's about 26 years old at this time, and we see repairs to the temple being done. Of course, the temple was of preeminent importance in that time and age. Preeminent importance. It's where God's presence, where God had chose to reveal or manifest his presence with the people and to the people. Imperative we see the temple being repaired. So we see in Josiah here a seriousness and a desire to seek the Lord and to know the Lord. We see an evidence of this because he is, in fixing the temple, he is saying, God, we want your presence with us. God, we want your presence with us. Um, we see, of course, that reverence for the temple. We see here, you might notice this word, the remnant of Israel. The remnant of Israel in those verses. The remnant of Israel, obviously, you will know the, the kingdom had split. And Israel, the ten tribes had, of the north, had been taken into captivity by this time, 722 BC, if you wanted to know. But the, the, the tribes are gone by, by the Assyrians. They take them off into captivity. And of course, the remnant of Israel, meaning those who had somehow not escaped or gone. And of course, Josiah's time period is 640 BC to 609 BC. So the remnant that was left, these are those guys. And um, interestingly, also, we see all who were skillful with musical instruments, even those dudes, the musicians, were helping out in the fixing of the temple. Gotta love that. Musicians doing something with their hands, quite apart from just leading us in music. Sweetness, right? And now we get to really the turning point of the text. The turning point of the text in the chapter. And so we can dial in here and hang out for a little bit. We get to verse 14. They were fixing the temple and all that good stuff. And we get to verse 14 and it says, When they were bringing out the money which, had brought, that which, they had been, which had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah, the priest, found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Oh my goodness. These guys had lost the book of the law. How on earth did they manage that? Really, how did they manage this? This is, this is quite some feat. At first glance, it seems that way. But I think that I'd like to suggest there's a couple of reasons why that made it pretty plausible, pretty easy for them to do this. One, if we remember a few weeks ago, we talked about this dude called Manasseh, right? Manasseh reigned for... 
50 odd years, and most of that time was pretty bad, right? The king, there's not too much good. Everything that was Manasseh was supposed to do, actually Manasseh doesn't do. And so we know Manasseh didn't do too much good, and so we know we can imagine what would have happened to the godly influences, the good things, the things of the Lord that would have been in the land at this time. He would have obviously squelched them. So it's not that hard to imagine, one, given that fact. Well, then we had Amon, his son, who ruled for two years, and he didn't do much better either. In fact, he was terrible. He, he, he lasted only two years, but he also did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. So we have this Josiah, where they, they are, have abandoned the temple, of course, and now we see Josiah rep repairing it, and of course, they find the book of the law. There's at least probably one other, reasons why, one other reason why I think perhaps it wasn't so hard for them to lose the, 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 the law of the Lord. At this time, we really think that perhaps the law of the Lord actually stayed in the temple. Stayed in the temple, all right? So if they're ignoring the temple, they're not going to go in there. They're certainly not going to find that there, the scroll in there. But the second thing is, if you think about it at that time, they aren't in modern-day America like we are, right? We are in modern-day America. If we want a copy or a print of something in whatever language we would like, if you'd like to read the Old Testament in the Hebrew, you know what you can do? You can get a Hebrew Old Testament, a Masoretic text, and you can read it. If you want to read the Koine Greek, you can do it. You can find one of those. If you want to find it in English, French, you can find it in all sorts of languages. For them, not so. They didn't have such a plethora of these scrolls lying around. So, of course, this... This means that if there is not so many sources lying around and we have kings like Manasseh and Amon and they're not doing the things of the Lord, it's quite easy for us to imagine that there wasn't too much of the law lying around. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 6 and 7 says this unto us. These are the words which I'm commanding you today. You sh shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise up. We see that in Deuteronomy and we see this admonition given to parents. And so in that we already see that there was an incredible oral tradition. That's how they, they were able to, to tell the next generation about what, of the things of God. It was an oral thing. They were telling the people. They would, didn't have a written source that like we have today as per se. I mean, they had some scrolls, but not like we, what we have today. Notice there in Deuteronomy, it says, you shall teach them diligently to your sons, and you shall talk of them when you sit, when you walk, when you lie down, when you rise up. I know we have parents in our room, and I know some of us have younger children in the room, and so the, op the, the parents here are admonished, even in that time, to raise up their children and to take every opportunity that the Lord gives to raise up the children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Um, I like this thing here that it seems to point to this thing called, or what I would call, a teachable moment. A teachable moment. I used to love this in university, you know, when I was fortunate enough to be a leader. People would come to me and say, Hey, Donnie, what do you think about this? Brethren, that was a beautiful thing. You know why? Because that was a teachable moment. That was a moment that I could use to, brother, this is what you are considering. Might I urge you to consider what the Lord would have you do? Point them to the scriptures, of course. And of course, point them to Christ, right? Teachable moments. There's times where you would like, or I would like to force my way in, you know, and just kind of, I see the situation unfolding. I want to jump in and say, and a lot of times, here's what happens, what could happen when, when, I, when I did do that, or when I do that. They go, oh, okay, cool, thanks. That's it. That's it. But when they would say to me, Donnie, what do you think? What would you say? Well, Donnie, well, what should I do here? Wow. Praise the Lord, man. The door is open now. 
I'm going to come right on in. Well, this, you're asking my advice? Okay. Well, the, the, the Lord would, I think, as I read the scriptures, this is what I think the Lord would have you do. It's a teachable moment. And I know the Lord will give you many as you raise your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. It makes life a lot easier once that door is already open. Judges chapter 2 verse 10 says this. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Like for them, like it is for us, we are but one generation away from people who don't know the Lord. That our generation, we know the Lord, yes, fine, well done. The next generation, we are one generation away from them not knowing the Lord. There's a couple of applications that I think we can bring here to the fore. Firstly, if you have not had an opportunity to teach in our children's ministry, man, maybe this is an opportunity for you today. Have you ever led someone to the Lord? Like, had that opportunity, that honor, really, to lead someone to the Lord? The best place you could go in some ways. The best place you could go. Where your labors will very likely bear fruit is in the children's ministry or working with youth and kids. Seriously. If you look at the stats today, there's all kinds of stats going around, but the, 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 the stats basically say this to us. Most people who get saved, get saved before the age of 18. So if I could, how many of us were saved before the age of 18 in this room? Well, brethren, if you look around the room here, you'll probably see those hands that did go up. I would say probably a majority, which is what the stats say would, would happen, right? Because even in Josiah, we saw the tenderness that is in the hearts of children. There's a tenderness in the hearts of children for the Lord. You want to lead someone to the Lord? You know the best age group to work with? Go hang out with Josiah when he was eight years old. It's a good place to be because there's every chance little Josiah will say, hey, I want to give my life to the Lord, or in some form or fashion. Highly encourage it. So these guys find the book of the law. Incredible, really. I, 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 I love it when I'm back in the, with the kids. Sometimes I, I like to hide things from them. And I say, hey, hey, to reinforce my lesson. Hey, I've hidden some things across the, in the classroom. Would you go and find them? Oh, they, yeah, they they dive in, man. They're under the tables. They're looking everywhere. And sometimes, you know, it's funny. The, the, the one time I, I put the thing like, it was like hidden in plain sight. You know, I had it like on the TV kind of thing. And the kids, the two kids were running around looking for this. Where, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Just, just right in front of them. Um, these guys, the law was right there. And they find it. Thank the Lord. Um, you will see in the next coming verses here the emphasis on the book, the book, all right? You're going to notice that in, it's at least seven times, I would say, um, possibly more than that, but seven times at least that I think I counted. So let's pick up verses 15. Oh, sorry, one more thing I'd like to say. This guy, Hilkiah the priest, high priest, um, if you reference Ezra chapter 7, you'll probably note that Hilkiah was probably, probably, the grandfather of Ezra. And so how cool, how, what must Ezra have felt writing this? Because we believe it was Ezra that wrote Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah. It's like, man, my grandfather, he was the guy. He was the guy who found the book of the law in the temple. How excited must he have been when he was penning these words? Anyway, sorry, that's just a side note. Let's pick up verses 15 and uh, take it through. Noticing the emphasis on the book, because that is very important here. So Ezra, is, or the, the chronicler, is making it, repeating the words. Hilkiah responded and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Then Shaphan brought the book to the king and reported further word to the king, saying, Everything that was entrusted to your servants, they are doing. They have also emptied out the money which was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hands of the supervisors and the workmen. Moreover, Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest gave me a book. And Shaphan read from the book in the presence of the king. Notice the emphasis there on the book. Pretty important, right? 
they needed God's word then, we need it now today. It's interesting that there's a little bit of a, a Schaefer says a book in there in verse 18. Prior to that, it was, was the, the book. And we see that there is, um, maybe if you want to call it a slight indifference in his heart. Um, anyway, let's pick up verse 19. It says that they were reading in verse 18. What will be the response of the king hearing the words of the book? It says this, when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam, the son of Shephan, Abdon, the son of Micah, um, Shephan, the scribe, and Asiah, the king's servant, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel, Judah, concerning the book which, was, which has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord which is poured out on us because our fathers have not observed the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. I think we could not hope for a better response in Josiah. He tore his clothes. Now, I'm reading the book to you. I'm reading the scriptures to you, but I don't see any of you tearing your clothes. I think you should. Of course, I'm being a little facetious. That is not a culturally appropriate thing for us to do in America. That is to say, we don't do that here. Perhaps I could have made you stand up when we read the scriptures, and that might be a more culturally appropriate thing that we do to show that we honor the word of the Lord. But we see Josiah, he tears his clothes. We saw David tear his clothes when Jonathan and Saul had died. We, we see Job tear his clothes. We saw Reuben tear his clothes when Joseph was gone from the system that he had hit him in. We see Paul and Barnabas tear their clothes in Lystra when the people start worshiping them. It was a sign of incredible remorse in their time and age. Of course, we don't rip our clothes. We don't put ashes on our head. We don't shave our heads as per se. Perhaps the other thing that we do in our culture to reflect our remorse or, or, or this kind of thing is maybe when we pray, we get on our hands and knees. We show that, you know what, Lord? I'm physically down because I know, man, we feel convicted for what we have done. We see in Josiah an incredible conviction of sin. He sees that the wrath in verse 18 is great. The wrath is great upon us for we have not done what was right. So what do we do in our day and age? What do we do? We don't rip our clothes up. Well, I'm glad you asked. Joel chapter 2 verse 12 through 14 says this to us, right? It says, Yet now even, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting and weeping and rend your heart and not your garments. Rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate. He is very slow to anger, and he is abounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil. Who knows he, he, will, not re, he, who knows he will not turn and relent and even leave a blessing behind him. Sometimes God's word is spoken. We have a revelation of God. We have this truth coming at us big question for us to ask is how is it that we are responding to God's truth to us today are we like Josiah with his response and if we're not why not I think is the good question to ask why are we not like that why are we not like Lord your word is speaking to our hearts why or your word is not speaking to our hearts why isn't it speaking to our hearts if it's not Let's figure it out, because it ought to speak to our hearts. The word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is living and active. It's, in the words of Jeremiah 23, 29, it is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. Man, the words, the words of the Lord are living and active. It's profitable for our teaching, for our rebuke, for our correction, for our training in righteousness, so that the man of God will be equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. If it is not having that effect in our lives, I think we need to ask why. Why ever not? Just some
quick practical points that I can give you to help you out in your Bible reading. Um, one of the things I think you can do right out the gate, right out the gate, when you pick up that there Bible of yours, I think you could pray. Hey, Lord, please, let your spirit lead me. Let your spirit guide me. Open my eyes to the things that you want me to see. We can ask for a spirit in our lives, right? I think the other thing that there's an easy question that we can always ask ourselves. What is God's heart in this? What is God's heart in this? This, this scripture is not just some writing, right? It's a revelation of who God is. So what is God's heart in this? God, what is your heart? How can I see who you are in this scripture? Um, might I warn us to not be too focused on the scriptures themselves? And we, we, we fixed and we're dialed in and we're looking at the words and we're just pouring over things and we're noticing the differences and similarities and the grammatical things going on. On one level, that is good. On another level... Let's not get so caught up in the trees that we lose the big picture that the Bible is a revelation of who God is. It's a revelation of who God is. We don't want to be worshipping the Bible. We want to be worshipping the God of the Bible. And we know that the Bible points us to God. And if we want to see God, guess what we have to do? We look into the revealed scripture to see who God is and how he has revealed himself. That we might align ourselves with the things that he has said. It's a revelation from who him? From him. It's a special revelation from him to us. Um, for the young lovers in the room, or the married couples in this room, many of us have received this thing called a love letter before, right? Some of us, many of them. Some of them, some of us, not so many of them. But some of us have all probably received a love letter or a note from a, someone that we admire, perhaps. When we read that letter, a lot of times, we look at it, oh, wonderful, this person is considering me, this person is thinking about me, oh, it's so wonderful. Might we consider, in a little way, our Bibles a little bit like that? God's revelation, God's love letter to us. I think we hit that. Jonah, oh, excuse me, let's get verses 22. It says this, so Hilkiah then arose, and those whom the king, I'm sorry, excuse me. Verse 22. So Hilkiah and those whom the king had told went to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tokath, the son of Harasha, the keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke to her regarding this. And she said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am bringing evil on this place and on its inhabitants, even, on the, even all the curses written in the book which they have read in the presence of the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath will be poured out on this place, and it shall not be quenched. So Josiah, we see here, he realized what's is going on. There's going to be great travesty here. Um, and he sends out a delegation. Hey, go seek the Lord for me. Go seek the Lord for me. And they go to this prophetess, Huldah. Interesting that she's a prophetess. There's one of four in the Old Testament. Deborah was one of them. Um, Miriam was one of them. But this prophetess, Huldah, again, we wonder why was there a prophetess? What happened to the prophets? Well, of course, we think back again to Manasseh that wasn't that long ago that had shed the blood of much innocent people. We even think he shed, of course, Isaiah's blood. And of course, there we have probably the prophets had died during the reign of Manasseh. And so there's a prophetess here. And she speaks to the people. She tells them what is going to happen. There will be evil brought on this place, even the curses. The curses, Deuteronomy chapter 27, 9 through 26, or chapter 28, 15 through 68. I'll leave you to reference that for yourself. But if you've heard me speak of the Old Testament before, you've probably heard me reference the curses that were in the Old Testament law. They, these guys were probably reading from Deuteronomy. They saw the curses. They were like, what are we going to do? And here it is here in 29. I'll just dialogue for you verses 25 through 28 it says this then men will say because they forsook 
the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he had made with them. He brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they have not known and whom he had not allotted to them. Therefore the anger of the Lord burned against them, burned against that land to bring upon it every curse which is written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and in fury and in great wrath and cast them into another land as it is to this day. So there we have it. There are curses. God says there's two ways to go. There's a way of life. There's a way of blessings. There's a way of curses. If they don't go in the way that I'm asking you to go, we see the, the curses being brought out on the people. We see this here in verses. So the first few verses, we see 23 to 25, we see the, 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 the curses coming upon the nation. But of course, there's Josiah the king, and the next few verses really deal with him. 26 to 28, it says this. But to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus you will say to him, thus says the Lord God of Israel regarding the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against its inhabitants, and because you humbled yourself before me, tore, tore clothes and wept before me, truly I have heard you, declares the Lord. Behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, so your eyes will not see all the evil which I will bring on this place and on its inhabitants. And they brought back word to the king. So we see that Josiah... We see in him, the, the prophet says, you had a tenderness of heart. He had a tenderness, a softness of heart. Let us be people with soft hearts and hard hands, right? We don't want to be hard-hearted and soft-handed. We want to be people who work, who serve, because we have soft hearts. We don't want to be hard-hearted, tender-hearted. We see Josiah is tender-hearted. We also see that he humbled himself before the Lord his God humbled himself. It even it's even repeated twice. You, 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 you humbled yourself. You humbled yourself. And it says you tore your clothes and you wept. If there was ever a recipe for repentance, there it is really quickly for you in a nutshell. Um, there is no one size fits all as per se in our repentance and our turning to the Lord because I know wherever we are in our walk with the Lord, there are things that we do that are not right. Some of us, our sins are very public. It's out in the open. Everybody can see them. That is your sin. We can all see you're doing something wrong. When we turn, we repent. We humble ourselves. We, we do as Josiah did. For some of us, our sins are a little bit more private, right? They're in our hearts. Pride, envy, jealousy, anger, bitterness. These kinds of things that may not always be so publicly evident. Publicly evident. We still need the same thing. We still need to repent of our sins and turn to the Lord. Humbleness tenderness of heart. Um, I'm sure you can hear in this the echoes of Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, yes, humble, pray, seek my face. We see Josiah turn, sending out people to seek the Lord for him. Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Repentance, we're going one way. We repent, we turn around and we go the other way. Then I will hear them from heaven and I will forgive their land. I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Um, you can think of Peter in the New Testament, who repented. You can think of Psalm 51, the whole of Psalm 51. There's so much in Psalm 51 which talks of how David repented when he sinned. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, you will not despise those things. There it is. We could all go, oh my goodness, Lord, it's so hard to repent sometimes. It's so difficult to say, I'm sorry. Not just to you, Lord, but sometimes to somebody else, right? Let this verse encourage you from Hebrews chapter 4. It says this, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet he is without sin. Therefore... Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We have a high priest in Jesus who will always take us back. We have a high priest in Jesus who will always take us back. For those of us who are his children, he is our high priest. There is always grace. There is always mercy for us. And in Jesus, we see one who was tempted yet without sin. And that means... Jesus understood temptation far better than you and I do. 
because he felt the full weight of the temptation and he resisted it. You and I, here's what you and I do. We get tempted and a few seconds into that temptation, a few days into that temptation, a few weeks into that temptation, we might give in in some form or fashion. Jesus feels that full length of the temptation yet without sin. He doesn't give in. So brethren, if there's anybody who knows something about sin and temptation, it's him. You can go to him. The results of this, obviously, we, we, we see in verse 28 that Josiah is blessed. We see God hears and blesses Josiah. He says, Josiah, you know what? You are not going to die in this way. You are going to die in peace. So we know Josiah in the next chapter dies in a battle. But the destruction planned or the destruction that God says is coming is averted. It is pushed back a little bit. So Josiah does die in peace. He doesn't face the, those consequences because they had humbled themselves because he had humbled them. Verses 29 through 30, let's get him in. It says this, Then the king sent and gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. The king went up to the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the Levites, and all the people, from the greatest to the least, he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. That their book of the covenant, most certainly, almost certainly, is, is probably, definitely, I would say, I really think it is the book of Deuteronomy. Of course, we see the curses and, and blessings mentioned, and of course, we see the book of the covenant, which was certainly the book of Deuteronomy. So, the, so Josiah hears, and he tells the people. He tells the people. He gathers the people so that they can hear. Um, you can see that... In the following, you can see this in um, Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8. You can see um, them reading the word in 8 verse 3, Nehemiah 8 verse 3, when the people come back from the exile. This is just before the exile, in the post-exile, they come back and in Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 3, they read the book of the law from daybreak till noon. Imagine that. The people said, stood there and they read the book of the law. Verses 31 through 34, let's get in here. It says this. Then the king stood in his place, and he made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and his soul to perform the words of the covenant written in this book. Moreover, he had... I'm just going to stop there for a quick second, actually. You notice there that Josiah makes a covenant with the people and with the Lord. Of course... You guys are such great Bible scholars. I'm sure you're thinking Moses, of course. Moses in Exodus chapter 24, he also made that covenant. And notice how the, the, their hearts, their whole being, their, with their whole hearts, with their whole souls, um, truly an example of how we ought to be. It was an example for the, those people coming back from exile at that time because Chronicles is written for people coming back from exile. It's an example for us with the whole heart that we make that covenant with Jesus by grace through faith in him. Verse 32 says this, Moreover, he made all who were president in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand with him. And so the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Josiah removed all the abomination from all the lands belonging to the sons of Israel. And he made all who were present in Israel to serve the Lord their God. Throughout his lifetime, they did not turn from following the Lord God of their fathers. Wow. He did well. He did well. I'll read for you in, Jer in uh, Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 3 through 7. We see in Josiah a king who uses his influence for good. Right? He has a sphere of influence, and he uses it for good. You and I have a sphere of influence, things that affect us, that we can affect. We ought to use it for good. It says this in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Now it shall be, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Blessed you shall be in the city. Blessed shall you be in your country. Blessed shall the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground and the offspring of your beasts, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed 
shall, be, shall you be when you come in. Blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord shall cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They will come out against you one way, and they will flee before you seven ways. Deuteronomy 28 references the blessings. The king, when the king did well, when the king sought the Lord, when the king obeyed the Lord, there was blessings for the people, blessings, abundant blessings for the people. It's those two paths before us again. The way of life, the way of death. The way of blessings, the way of cursings, the way of death, the way of life. We have to choose which path we'd like to be on. I think one of the things that makes Josiah such a successful king, I don't know what your opinion is on, on, on what made him so successful, but I think one of the things for me is the guy's humility. We see it several times here. He was a humble man. He humbled himself. Um, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says this, in the same way you wives, okay, this is directed to wives, but I believe we can all learn something from this, okay? So I'm going to zoom out for a second. It is directed at wives, and in particular wives whose husbands don't know the Lord. That is the specific context. But let's just take a step back and all of us glean something from it. It says this, In the same way you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, that is that they don't know the Lord, that they may be one without a word, by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Um, the need for us to be that example, that humble example. I think that's what made Josiah such an influential guy because he wasn't this prideful guy wanting to be first, wanting to have his name honored, wanting to have his name in lights. No, he was the humble guy and he humbled himself before the Lord and the Lord exalted him. He was that guy who Jesus talks about. He says, Jesus says, don't be that guy who comes and sit in the place of honor. Rather be the guy who is there on the side that it's invited to the seat of honor. That is invited to the seat of honor. And we see in Josiah a guy who is humble and gets invited to the seat of honor. Brethren, on that note, let me pray for us. Lord, you are good to us. We thank you for your favor. We thank you for your faithfulness. And we pray that your revelation to us will convict our hearts, will challenge our hearts, will challenge our motives and make us a little bit more like you. Lord, thank you that your word is like a hammer. Thank you that your word is truth. We thank you for the example that we have in Josiah. We pray that we too can be like him and emulate his godliness and his humility and his desire to seek you and to honor you. So Lord, we tell you that we love you and we praise you for all you've done for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.